வெல்கம் யூ ஆர் லிசனிங் டு என்ஜிஎஸ் பாட்காஸ்ட் ப்ராட்யூ பை நெக்ஸ்ட் ஜென் சயின்டிஸ்ட் ஃபவுண்டேஷன் நெக்ஸ்ட் ஜென் சயின்டிஸ்ட் ஃபவுண்டேஷன் இஸ் அன் ஆர்கனைசேஷன் ஸ்டார்டட் பை இந்தியன் ரிசர்ச்சர்ஸ் டு ப்ரொமோட் சயின்ஸ் அண்ட் கிரியேட் சயின்டிஃபிக் அவேர்னஸ் அமாங் த ஜென்ரல் பப்ளிக் Good morning. Uh, I have pro- uh, with me Professor Gering. She is a member of Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and uh, Associate Professor at MIT. And uh, thank you for being with us today. And uh, Professor Gering is, uh, she is a recipient of prestigious awards. To name a few like NSF, Career Award and uh, Cells 40 under 40. Yes, that's right. And the Rosalind Franklin Award. Correct. Pew Scholar Award. and like it's very prestigious like whitehead fellow award like i heard like it's very difficult to get into it well i, w- I wasn't a whitehead fellow but whitehead faculty okay it's, it's separate, fine separate separate yeah. thing but yeah okay so um coming to your research like uh can i explain a brief like what you're currently working on and uh what is your focus like what do you want to say in like coming 10 15 years like Mm, 10 15 years that's hard but i can tell you about okay. the focus um right now um and project a little bit into the future maybe <laughs> maybe not 15 okay. years but um so so the lab is interested in understanding um epigenetic inheritance in okay. plants okay. and um trying to understand how much epigenetic information is um transmitted um from parent to progeny okay um and how that information is transmitted and also how is epigenetic information transmitted between cells and how does this information impact things like genome function and gene expression okay. and so um when i say epigenetic i'm yeah. referring to heritable information uh that is present but is not encoded in the dna itself okay. Yeah. And so a lot of what we focus on is um DNA methylation okay. which is um the addition of a methyl group to cytosine. Yeah. Um and we're also now getting more into things like small RNAs and yeah. and histone modifications. Okay. Um and so some of the questions that that we're asking are um it it seems from from our work and a lot of other people's yeah. research that um modulation of epigenetic information is very important during reproduction in plants. Yeah, yeah. Um specifically in specification of the gametes and in fertilization okay. and seed development. Mm. And so a uh, portion of the lab is focused on well what's going on during seed development? Mm-hmm. Um how is epigenetic information being modulated? Mm-hmm. Um and um why does that epigenetic information need to be modulated? And specifically okay. we're looking in this seed tissue called the endosperm okay. uh, which is like a placental tissue okay um and then in in um some other work in the lab so so i would say with 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 seeds what you know i f- i feel like i've been working on seeds well yeah. i have been working on seeds yeah, yeah. for quite a long time i had that yeah uh, <laughs> yeah you heard that you were expert in like isolating uh, endosperm like Uh I'm yeah I mean I I started yeah. I started doing that as a grad student so okay, yeah. so by now I have many years yeah. of experience in isolating endosperm yeah. and, um you know trying to do these sorts of assays yeah. genomic assays on small amounts of material and yeah. and things like that um but I I think you know I'm really excited now about some of the things yeah. you you were doing in understanding okay. how our um how our maternal and paternal genomes okay. in this tissue interacting with each other. Yeah, and then this one. Yeah. That's right, in yeah. the endosperm. Yeah. Um and why do you need this certain balance of maternal and paternal exactly. genomes that's to make a, a viable yeah. seed? Um That's a good question, yeah. Yeah, it's still it's still really unclear yeah. um uh why there are these sorts of barriers. Yeah. Um, and then um I'm really excited about some of the work that we're doing um looking at um from you know um from cell to cell or from generation to generation some of the work we've done with the ross one okay. and the reestat mm-hmm. um how that information is actually transmitted okay. and, and how um epigenetic marks may change during development okay what influenced your path to like plant biology like hmm. i mean i i 
I was always interested in my biology. I guess my okay. my dad was actually a high school biology teacher, oh. so he was my teacher. Um, okay. And um, I was always interested in genetics. I okay. was like genetics. Um, and then when I was in college, um, my junior year of college, a, a new professor started um, her lab and, okay. and her group, and she taught a class on plant biology, which okay. I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I started working in her lab, okay. uh, which is where I first started working on a rabbit okay. as an undergraduate. Um, and I just always thought plants were very fascinating. Um, yeah. I don't know. I was very excited at that time. I was very excited about plant hormones, like okay. how are plants um, sending signals? You know, yeah. how are they perceiving the environment? Yeah. Um, how are they doing all these things without a nervous system? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I always thought plants okay. were, were really interesting organisms, even though they look like they're just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so that, so working in our lab really got me interested, okay. um, in plant biology. And I also, um, one of the stories I, I, I tell is that when I was, also a junior or senior in college, Norman Borlaug okay. came and gave a talk. Oh, great. And, um, and it was very inspiring to listen to him. Okay. And he talked about his history and um, uh, his work at Simmons. Yeah. And, um, you know, and one thing he said was, well, people think we've solved these problems, but uh, we haven't solved these problems like, Yes, we made this great progress, but there's there's all these problems and, and all these people in the world uh, to feed. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and so that that I think as like a 21 year old person, I was okay. very inspired by. Yeah. Um, and so, given my background and and everything, um, yeah. and working in a plant lab, okay, and I just yeah yeah that's what I decided to do. Yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. You published a science paper in. So, uh, this is nine. Nine. so uh, what what do you think like the thing you did which others did not do like I mean oh, like, you were why like that a science yeah yeah well you know a lot of this is 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 timing and luck so yeah. it's maybe because you isolated endosperms in the very early stage yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think the reason that um, was a science paper I mean who who knows <laughs> okay. uh, but um, the cool thing there so as a as a as a Grad student, I had focused on the imprinting regulation of this gene, Medea. And um, we had shown that it was regulated by DNA demethylation, um, which was very exciting because this was... um, So plants were the first organism where Mm. a DNA demethylase enzyme was positively identified. Um, In in plants, it's their their 5-methylcytosine DNA glycosylases. And um, so I knew that... um, you know, that there was this one gene, mm-hmm. um, this imprinted gene, where okay. uh, the, the DNA demethylase DME was acting. Yeah. And so when I started my postdoc, I went to a genomics lab and yeah. I wanted to learn Hennico genomics. Lab yeah, and... uh, Steve Hennikoff's yeah. lab. And it just seemed like endosperm was a great system. So that lab had started doing methylation profiling in plants. Oh, after, you, after you moved into the lab? Uh, Basically, no, it's were, like an, a cancer research institute. I saw like right. It's in the on it's, chromatin biology. And that's correct. Stuff. So yeah. it's in the um, basic sciences division okay. of a of a cancer research okay. institute. So it's kind of like here. I mean, okay. um, so the the Hennikoff lab is focused on chromatin and okay. epigenetics in mm-hmm. a wide variety of organisms. Okay. Um, and so there were already a couple of people working in plants. Okay. Um, yeah, and so um, we decided to look at endosperm and. and what I was, you know, I think the things that were surprising from that study mm-hmm. um, was that demethylation wasn't just happening at imprinted genes. Okay. It was happening more broadly. And specifically, it was happening at repetitive elements. Like, it, mm-hmm. it didn't seem to be a gene-directed process. Okay. It's yeah. just that the expression of some genes got caught up in, in what was going on in nearby TEs or repeats. Yeah. And so I think that... That for me was the exciting part. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was it was difficult to isolate the material to do the experiment. Exactly. Now, you know, techniques have changed, and it would be much it's yeah, yeah much easier. I mean, yeah. we do that all the time in the lab. Exactly. But at the time, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, people. Yeah, most of the yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, 
So, uh, did you find in your career like any biggest challenge and which was difficult to tackle it? I mean, usually the challenges are like experiments not working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, sort of like thinking yeah, yeah. through. Um, I mean, now maybe the challenges are different. The challenges are like getting funding exactly uh, to be able to run the lab that yeah, I want to yeah. run. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, that. That's. I mean, yeah, I think I, I've been I've been quite lucky um, okay. in my career. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there are times where it feels like nothing's working. Yeah. Um, I mean, more so. It's kind of nice when you have a lab because there's lots of people in the lab. Yeah, yeah so you can do some, Something is working. <laughs> but when you're a grad student, it will yeah. be your responsibility. Exactly. And if it's and not so working, you're worried. Yeah. When you're a grad student postdoc, yeah. I mean. A lot of anxiety, yeah, yeah, and sorrow over things not working. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, your entry into science was like by choice or by chance? Like, uh, you knew that you want to be a like scientist. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. No, okay. I didn't. No, I mean okay. when I was. Um, I mean, I always liked science, and as okay. I mentioned, my yeah, yeah, my dad was yeah. a science teacher. Yeah. Um. um but I think going to college, I thought I thought I might um, major in English, or I, I also always had a strong oh, interest in great. writing. Um, okay, being a writer. I think you should write a book, like <laughs> the genetics. Yeah. Um. So I, I always thought, yeah. So it wasn't until a couple of years in that I decided to, you know, really pursue biology. Okay. And then I didn't. Um, I actually didn't go to grad school immediately mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't sure I wanted to get okay. a PhD or what. Okay. I didn't really know what I wanted to oh. do. <laughs> um, so I I worked for a year at a consulting company actually. Okay. Um, then pretty quickly decided that was not for me. Okay. <laughs> um, and went to grad school. Okay. Um, and then even in grad school, I didn't have. I didn't. It wasn't like oh, I want to be a professor. Mm -hmm. Like I. Was okay. very open to doing different yeah. things and okay. it was just sort of as time went on and that that okay. you know it seemed like well I could do that if I wanted to and it was very exciting um, yeah. to have and um, the intellectual freedom that you get okay. with that yeah exactly that you don't get in the industry obviously well like, I've industry. never been in industry I, okay. I, mean, I, I think right you probably don't have the same yeah same kind of like you can't yeah. just decide, oh, I'm going to do this <laughs> yeah, experiment. Um, exactly. Yeah. Because it's fun or weird or interesting. Yeah. So, um, which which transition of your career was like more challenging, like from undergrad to grad school mm -hmm. or to grad school to a postdoc, being a postdoc to a PI? Uh, I which mean, I felt think... more challenging? And... I found the grad school, the postdoc, Transition okay. a bit challenging just because I, it seemed like at the end of your PhD, you're like, you have this body of work, you know, you've done yeah. this. Yeah. And then it sort of felt like, oh, I'm just going back to do the same, like, oh, like, okay. oh I have to do it all over again. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like you're like back to the bottom again. Exactly. Um, so that, that was a little bit challenging, I think, yeah. for a few months. Okay. Um, but, but nothing, nothing too bad. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, definitely the transition to a PI is, difficult okay um you know it was nice here that i didn't have to do any teaching in my first year okay. uh, but just figuring out um who to hire how to hire them how to interact with people okay. and um, figure out people's motivations and um then, you know that's always constant. i heard you're a good teacher like alex <laughs> was telling he was inspired by your teaching okay yeah. so uh so what do you think you already mentioned like if you're not a biologist, what you are doing? Oh, uh, what would I be doing? You did a literature? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I, I did want to write a novel at some point. but Oh, um, great. That, uh, that that will probably never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can write a book like, after some years. like Maybe when I'm yeah. a little, little more aged. Yeah. Um, perhaps. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I don't know what, what I would be doing. Because otherwise. you are working on like science of the century like i think <laughs> gut microbiome and epigenetics these two are like called as like science of the century because okay, yeah interesting perspective. and the the field is having a lot more to discover i mean uh -huh. there's a lot of dark matter to yeah. look into i think oh yes definitely. yeah um 
Yeah, so I don't know what else I'd be doing, but okay. probably something science related. Okay, yeah, know. yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, so uh, another question, like, how do you manage work-life balance? It's a common question, like being a wife, being a mother, mm-hmm. being a PI, and being a like a manager, of course, like mm-hmm. you you're managing a group and you will write for funding and yeah, I mean, I would say. I don't know. You just do what you have to do. I would say, <laughs> I feel like this summer I haven't been managing it particularly well, but, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it is difficult Sorry. because like sometimes people say, Oh, having kids made me like mm-hmm. better scientist. Okay. I don't necessarily <laughs> feel that's the case. Okay. I mean, it's just that you have less time, you know, For the to do, to do the same, you know, more. well, I mean, I feel like I, it's always one thing I feel like I'm not giving enough time to. It's either I'm not giving enough time to the science or I'm not giving enough time to the family. Okay. Um, You're kind of balanced with... Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess it's like, it's not like work with like balances. Everything is always 50-50. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like you prioritize at times value. you do this exactly. and at times you do that. So okay. they're just, you have to have priorities. And mm. um, yeah, I used to do a lot more things last minute than I used to before I had, <laughs> had kids. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Just like annoyed at yeah. certain times. <laughs> Do you think like uh, the gender bias still exists in the science? Like, oh, definitely. I mean, I okay. guess so. I mean, bad. you you look at the. I mean, you look at what are the percentage of female exactly. faculty, tenured female faculty at various institutions, and exactly. it's not that there hasn't been enough time for. Um, women to rise yeah, to, yeah. to the highest levels of science. I mean, women have been getting um, yeah, half people the PhDs have done for like, a yeah, long time. Yeah. Um, so I think there are, there are definitely still systemic issues. Yeah. Very difficult to know how to exactly to address those. Exactly. So uh, the last question, maybe. Like, uh, oh, yeah. I actually have to meet some <laughs> yeah, now. So this is the time. So... Uh, you, I think you are like successful. I call you successful, like, because you got like all the things in very early age. Like, you have like now you are a PI. Like, uh-huh. what do you think? What is, I can ask directly, what is the secret of success? Like, the, what do you think that you, uh, made you different from others? Well, I don't know that I'm different from others. Um, I would say things that make you successful in science are, um, I mean, you constantly have to have your, be curious and okay. be motivated. Okay. Um, being a good writer is key. Um, exactly. Um, being able to communicate with others. Mm-hmm. Um, not being obsessed with everything. I mean, being able to tolerate ambiguities okay. in, um, in your data and, and to not throw away ambiguities, but, but recognize them and exactly. uh, think about them. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you very, very much. Thanks for listening to Next Gen Scientist Podcast. If you liked listening to the podcast, kindly let us know in the comment section. Besides podcasts, Next Gen Scientist Foundation is organizing an internship program and an essay writing competition primarily targeted towards students pursuing life science degrees. For details, visit our website ngsf.in. Thank you.